I think coach development is, is, you know, near and dear to, to my heart, um, you know, and, and every opportunity to, to tune into the webinar series you've had, I've certainly taken advantage of that. So it's uh, great to see some familiar faces on here. A lot of names I recognize, um, people that I've met, you know, over the years, it's, um, you know, it's always cool to see that. So, um, I'll get started and, and really, you know, I, I know the, the crux of the presentation is, you know, a closer look at the role of body position and puck protection as Jeff kind of alluded to, but I kind of started it with puck acquisition because I think this is, you know, really important in the context of uh, the role that body position and puck protection play, because uh, in order to protect the puck, you know, first and foremost, we, we need to have the puck, we need to acquire it. And, um, you know, this is something that I, I've started to take a lot closer look at. You know, I was able to watch Daryl Belfry do a really interesting presentation on this. This is an area of the game that I know even in the HEO webinar series, um, there's been some really great discourse about this exact topic, some really good drills, you know, shared by the 67's development team. It's, it's something that I think more and more um, we're seeing an emphasis on uh, and levels of play. And so I start here um, with this survey. And this is something that I sent out to our players in Erie, but also I've had the opportunity to work with an 06 AAA team in a support role um, throughout the here in the Niagara region. So I, I sent a, sh a short survey out about how much we get the puck. And you know, uh, on the left, you know, the OHL players, do you feel like you get the puck enough in a game? This is forwards only that I asked. 10 out of 12 said no. Uh, and then interesting enough, uh, for the 06 AAA team, 12 players responded forward and defense. 10 out of 12 said yes. And um, I don't know if I have necessarily a, a great answer for why, but you know, from my own experience, and I'm sure many of you have had the same thing, even playing hockey, you know, you always feel like the best nights that you had, you had the puck the most, um, and you feel the best, and you always want to have the puck more. And so, you know, I, I thought this was really cool. I, I saw this in 31 Thoughts from Elliot Friedman. Just this week. Um, Mario Ferraro on the San Jose Sharks was talking about a number of different things, but one of the quotes uh, that he had about playing with Brent Burns was one common request was just get me the puck, get me the puck. You know, even if, you know, you shoot it in the air, um, whether it's flat or three feet in the air, you know, like Brent Burns just wants the puck. And I think, again, you ask any of the elite players that you've coached, they all want the puck more. Um, but sometimes, you know, there are different ways to acquire the puck and obviously passing is one of them like that previous quote, but I, I thought it would be really interesting to get a perspective from players on why do you feel like you don't get the puck enough. So these first answers were from the 06 AAA team and I highlighted in red some that I feel aren't necessarily relevant, very immature answers to be honest. Um, and, and, and more things that are outside of a player's control. I don't feel like I get the puck enough because people don't look for the centerman. I feel like forwards don't use the D enough at the point. You know, uh, sometimes the forwards keep shooting it and don't look for the D. And, and some, some of that may be true. Um, but I think probably in the context that we're talking about, it's not really relevant to this discussion. So again, getting a player's perspective on why they don't get the puck enough, uh, I don't play with the puck enough because I need to be more aggressive. It's valid. Um, you know, something that was a common theme for the minor hockey players was moving their feet or creating space, getting open, being a bad option. When we look at the answers from an OHL perspective that some of the players shared, um, you know, supporting the puck, moving feet, that's something that came up again. But, you know, I highlighted because confidence was something that came up multiple times and, and, I put these two on this slide, but confidence is a tricky thing because, um, and I think this may give us some hints as to why players in the OHL may be feel like they don't get the puck enough in contrast to a minor hockey player, because there are a lot of things that change. Um, when you go up a level, 
you know, players are bigger, they're stronger, they're faster. There are more things that will uh, prohibit you from feeling confident. And so this presentation about um, acquiring the puck and then body position and, and puck protection is about how we can instill more confidence in our players and, and use these uh, tactics and skills to be more confident even as you go to the next level. And I had a conversation just this week with a former player of ours in Erie who's now playing in the American Hockey League. Um, and he was talking about feeling less confident. And one of the things, you know, I, I talked about was, well, you know, you may feel like you have less time now, but, you know, when you came to us, you had the same feedback. And what improved the most was the level of detail you played with to help create more time for yourself. And the way you create more time for yourself and the way you feel more confident um, is by doing some of these things. So before I get to video, I, I wanted to look at acquiring the puck and puck touches in general and, you know, the numbers of, of puck touches. So this data is about um, an average OHL forward per 15 minutes of, of five on five, even strength ice time. You know, in, in that 15 minutes, an average player will touch the puck 35 times um, and only 15 of them are in the ozone and then less than one are going to be in home plate per 15 minutes of ice. That's an average player. If we look at elite players, they have, you know, four, there were five players in the OHL who averaged 45 total puck touches or more. So 10 more puck touches, but then, um, you know, half were in the ozone, half of the increase were in the ozone. And then home plate, that amount actually triples compared to an average player. So, you know, what does it tell us? 34 out of 35 touches are outside of home plate, which we know. So the question is, what are we doing to make our puck touches more valuable or help us set us up for success? And then finally, elite players touch the puck more, but especially more in the ozone and home plate on a percentage basis. So the question is, what are elite players doing to acquire the puck more often and maximize the value of the puck touches they get to put themselves in those positions? And uh, again, I'm going to get to the video soon, but I think it's really important as coaches that we examine our framing of how we acquire the puck. And so one of the most common phrases that I hear when players are being assessed by their coach or feedback that we give is improving play without the puck. Well, no one wants to play without the puck. And I think that's why when we frame this, it's difficult sometimes to put into context that the reason we want to improve our play without the puck is so that we can acquire the puck more. And when you have the puck, how do we improve our play with it? So first we're gonna look at improving our play without the puck um, and then how to acquire the puck through body position and uh, a term that you know I've come to adopt from, from Daryl uh, Belfry is, pre-possession puck protection. So um, why do we want to improve our play without the puck is to position ourselves to acquire or reacquire the puck and then prepare ourselves for the possession. So how do we do it? Um, and now I'm going to get to the, the first part of the video. So just bear with me. I'm going to switch over here. Um, So the first thing that we're going to look at in terms of acquiring the puck more um, would be like something that, you know, many of us would call inside body position, uh, a bump or, or a nudge. And there was a great example of this. I, I shared it on Twitter earlier this afternoon of um, Mikheyev in Toronto getting inside body position on Connor McDavid, you know, a uh, great example of getting that inside body position. So if we're looking to acquire the puck more, you know, in 50 fifties or 60 forties, you know, one of the first tactics we can use is this, this nudge. And it's something where, you know, in this race to the puck, these two players begin with sort of a, an equal opportunity to acquire the puck, but it's our detail that's going to allow us to acquire it. So this nudge of simply getting the hip and back through the hands of the opposition will allow us to get the inside track to acquire a puck. Okay. Now, if we look at the outcome of what happened, the puck was acquired, but what happened next, we don't love. So 
We're going to look at a few more examples um, before I move on to what we're doing with the puck, but here's another different context, but it starts with a 50-50 or a 60-40, and then just this little nudge with the shoulder through the hands of this player allows 29 white to gain just that extra separation to allow himself to get possession of the puck. And then when we talk about instilling confidence, you know, well, you're more confident when you have more time. So this little nudge provided that extra moment of time. Just a couple more examples here. Okay. And, and, and this is uh, a nudge is a way to overcome other deficiencies within your game. So, you know, this player here is, is five foot seven, uh, 16 year old, you know, in the league, um, you know, definitely not fully developed in terms of muscle or weight yet. And this particular defenseman, you know, I believe is six foot three or six foot four, been in the league a couple of years. Well, this action of nudging inside, you know, allows our player to win the race. Now, what happens next, you know, is something that we're going to talk about. But in terms of allowing the puck more, you know, if players want to have the puck more, this simple detail, the simple habit of nudging through the hands, taking away this player's ability to make a play on the puck allows us to make a play. Um, and then a couple more nudges, right? Here's another example on the four check through the hands. And then one more, again, this was actually from a couple of years ago, but a 16 year old player going up against a six foot seven NHL draft pick, you know, what starts as a 50, 50 race turns into possession. Um, you know, I, I mentioned um, on Twitter that I, I was going to look at this from the lens of more than just OHL clips or, or just NHL clips. So um, this is something that is a really, really essential habit, you know, in, in women's hockey. If there are any women's hockey coaches on here, they can attest that, you know, even though there is no body checking allowed in this game, body contact is certainly permitted um, in women's hockey. And, you know, the more I, I got to watching the NWHL tournament and some of the PWHPA stuff, uh, the more it became apparent that this, um, you know, this puck acquisition habit of, of inside body position or pre-possession puck protection, you know, is really, really important in this game. And, um, you know, this is where there's some, you know, inherent value. If you can play, um, with these details, you know, you're going to end up with the puck a lot more and maybe exploit, um, you know, some, some opportunities. So the second thing that I want to look at is more a uh, surround puck where, you know, you're using your hips to get around the puck and invite contact on the back. And here's another example that kind of happened back to back here where you're surrounding the puck. Okay. And again, this is just in the context of acquiring it, but you're sealing off your opponent with surrounding it, instead of nudging or bumping them, you're just kind of surrounding that puck with your hips. Again, the, the principle is the same of getting inside the hands, but now you've acquired the puck, okay? And then a seal is very similar, but this is an NHL clip, okay, where maybe there's a little bit of a bump or a nudge there, but you're sealing off this opponent by using the boards to your advantage, creating that wall, okay, to acquire the puck right? And, and prevent them from getting possession. So, uh, you know, a couple looks of what a seal and surround might look like. Okay. This is a great example, arm up on the boards, but sealing off the defender from gaining possession of the puck. Right. And here's a seal and surround example. Okay. Maybe using a little bit of stick detail, but then just surrounding it, using the hips turning and then sealing off this opponent on the wall moving into possession. So those are some examples of how we can acquire the puck more. Um, but that still doesn't give us an explanation or any further context into um, puck protection, you know, once we have it. So, you know, once we've got it, great. Um, what are we doing next? So when we talk about improving our play with the puck, right? The question is, why do we protect the puck. Well, of course, we protect the puck to prevent our opponent from gaining or regaining possession. But I think more importantly, you know, it's what happens next after we've protected it. And that objective is to 
improve the conditions of the puck that they're currently in. If it's on the wall, it's getting it into the middle of the ice. If it's in the corner, it's creating a scoring opportunity. Or if we're in the defensive zone, it's getting the puck uh, in a controlled zone exit. We want to protect the puck and then improve the conditions that it's currently in. And then finally, you know, we want to link our first possession uh, into a sequence of, of multiple possessions. So, you know, after we've acquired it once, what are we doing to maybe move the puck, but then put ourselves in a position to get it back? And there's a role that, um, you know, body position and puck protection play. And, and something that I'd just like to, you know, maybe reiterate before we continue is, you know, body positioning or pre-possession protection aren't the only things we need to consider when we're acquiring the puck. Of course, systems, close support, positioning, you know, stick presentation if we're receiving a pass, um, effort, you know, our, our details in terms of shoulder checks, communication, those will all help us get the puck more too. But I just wanted to look at the, the lens of, um, you know, body position as it relates to acquiring the puck. So I'm going to go back to video and I want to start with two clips of what I mean by improving the conditions of the puck. Here's a great example where we get a seal and a surround of the puck. Okay. We've protected it. But where the puck starts on the wall, okay, it ends in a dead play in a zone exit for the opposition. So even though we protected the puck here, we did a, a tremendous job, you know, what's next? What have we done to improve the conditions of the puck? And the answer is nothing. It started on the wall, it ended on the wall. So the puck protection itself, you know, was, was essentially um, useless. It was, it was inefficient. And this is another example that we see all the time where, you know, we're protecting the puck, whether it's through cutbacks, okay, using pick plays, but we start in the corner and we finish in the corner. It ends up in the puck leaving the zone. So we get multiple puck touches. We've protected the puck, but ultimately we never improve the conditions and it ends in a dead play. So you know, what is the role of body position and puck protection in improving um, the conditions of the puck so that we can get more touches in home plate, um, which is what elite players do. So when we look back at some of the nudges, okay, this was a great job of acquiring it, but then the next play was a giveaway and it ends up in a potential odd man rush going the other way. You know, sometimes these nudges, end up in positive plays. Um, here's another example, right, that we looked at. We got a nudge, and then this time we improved the conditions of the puck. Um, and then here's one more, and this will kind of lead me into what's next. Um, this seal and surround, you know, we're able to make a play to control and, and exit the zone. So one thing um, after we've acquired the puck, and this is probably something everyone is familiar with, you know, I, I watched some of the presentations done already by the 67 skills team is cutting hands or, or hip through the hands. You know, this is something I think everyone is familiar with is getting that, you know, outer hip, staying low, and then driving the hip through the hands of the defender, right? That's one coming from the forehand side. Here's one example coming from the backhand side. You know, what this allows us to do is take away that defender's ability to make a play on us, create a little extra separation, hip through hands. You know, that's, uh, that's a very common one. Um, you know, this nudge, okay, nudge getting possession, but then the next play is getting that hip out, attacking through the defender's hands. So hip through hands is how we, you know, we may use a nudge to acquire it, but then cutting hands or going hip through hands is how we improve the condi conditions of the puck the next time. Um, you know, another one, I'll go back to this NWHL clip is, okay, we've sealed and surrounded to acquire the puck, but now this is one um, that, you know, Daryl uh, referred to with Patrick Kane that he sort of made famous is uh, back push or what he calls the Kane push where we surround the puck, we seal off. And then this is a posture that we often see opponents get in. We invite contact with our back. The first instinct they have is to push. Okay. So we turn our back, we surround it, but now this back push is using that leverage to improve the conditions from the wall to the middle of the ice. And here's a great example of Patrick Kane 
okay, where he invites the contact, he anticipates that it's coming, but by protecting it, surrounding it, here we see the defender's hands up in the back and then using that momentum to create this four or five feet of separation and take it from the wall to the middle of the ice, right? And there are a couple of different um, examples that we can look at where this, this can be applied in more than just the offensive zone. But we start with a puck on the wall, inviting contact in the back, propelling into the home plate area. And we talk about elite players. This 29 that you see in a lot of clips, Chad Yetman scored 43 goals for us last year in Erie um, and you know was, was drafted by the Chicago Blackhawks as a 19-year-old. These are the types of things, you know, that not every player um, tries to implement in their game. And so there's really some important detail here that we can use to become elite through our habits. And it's not just in the offensive zone. Um, you know, if we're looking at how we acquire the puck, well, here's that nudge, okay, getting inside the hands, but now using that back push, okay, into separation which ends in controlled zone exit so we've improved the conditions of the puck from a defensive situation by acquiring it and then using another form of puck protection to create a two-on-two -two and potentially a three-on-two opportunity coming out of the defensive zone um, and then you know here's just one more example of a winger's context where we're going to seal off our opponent this time in the open ice by building that wall and then getting a back push. Now we've got a, a four on two or, or even a five on two, actually, if, if the D had chosen to come up ice. So we, again, have improved the conditions of the puck. Uh, the next one, okay, so we've talked about acquiring the puck. Um, sometimes there are 50-50s where this applies, like this scenario, and then there are some times where we have the puck and, and it's sort of a, an evolution of what you would call a bumper and nudge. And that's sort of this, this chucking motion where you are physically throwing your opponent off of you. Um, so, you know, this one here, we see that little push with the arm to get that defender off. And now all of a sudden we've got three feet of space, which ends up in a goal. And it all starts with this, nudge okay but now there's a chuck and that's that extra space that we're looking for so here's a couple more examples okay again full possession but this time you know coming off of a uh, strong side wing right shot right side you're leaning in with your body to protect the puck but now the extra detail on this is that chucking motion with the arm to create now we've got six seven feet of space to make the next play Here's another one behind the net, okay? And, and the defenseman that he's up against in, in a couple of these clips, uh, again, NHL draft pick signed, you know, six foot four going up against five foot 11, but you can still use that violent motion of chucking, okay, to create space. And now we've improved the conditions of the puck from below the net, below the goal line to a shot from home plate for our teammate. And then if you're really big and really strong, um, you know, the chuck turns into a truck. Anyone who played uh, Madden with a truck stick would be familiar with this. But, you know, this is sort of that reverse hit where you're literally throwing momentum into your opponent. And uh, this particular player, 91, big, big, strong boy, okay, inviting the contact, but going with that reverse hitting motion. And again, the objective isn't just to protect the puck here it's to improve the conditions. So by chucking or, or, or trucking, okay, we've taken it from the wall to a position where now we're able to attack the net and get a touch in, in home plate. Um, so if I go back to, you know, the context of a seal, right? Well, the question is then what? So here's one where I showed this clip earlier. This player does a great job of sealing off the defender, but now we want to improve the conditions of the puck. So we start in the corner, okay? Well, what's next? And this sequence starts with a puck in the corner. A little bit of a tumble, okay? But, you know, we do a great job of getting inside hands both times by both of these players here, okay? Inside hands, inside hands. 
but the possession started in the corner. Okay. And now it ended in the corner and the cycles killed and the opposition is going to end up breaking this puck out. So, you know, what are we doing next after we've sealed off our opponent? And I look at this seal and now I look at this possession. Well, there's a great opportunity to have taken this puck acquisition. Okay. And turn it into one of those home plate touches that are so coveted. And I think one of the important things about all of this with body position and puck protection is we should always be inviting our players to challenge the details of our opposition. Um, and stick on puck is obviously not anything new, but I, there's certainly been a much more increased emphasis on defensive detail, you know, whether it's stick checking on puck, but we always want to take the opportunity to challenge the details of the team that we're playing against. And so that Mikheyev clip that many of you have probably seen from last night, you know, even the best players in the world, Connor McDavid is the best in the world, his details can be challenged. And I thought that, you know, the Toronto player did a, an incredible job of challenging the details of his opponent. And so this is a situation where, you know, what's next after we've acquired the puck, how can we protect it? And, and be in a more advantageous spot. And so this one, again, I'll, I'll give a lot of credit um, to, to Daryl for coining this terminology about attacking weak stick. You know, um, this is something that we've talked about in Erie, but maybe not yet necessarily used a recognizable term, but we want to attack the weak stick or challenge the detail of our opponent. And so here's this situation where this player's in a full extension with their stick, which is what our coaches are asking defending players to do, but there's an opportunity to take this puck from outside the dot to maybe driving back post. And we do that by attacking a weak stick. There's almost no strength on this. We can get our knee through the hand, okay? And attack that weak stick. As you see, as soon as the momentum goes through it, that stick is lifted. And now we've got a wide open net driving to the back post, okay? So here's a couple other examples, right? Coming from an off wing, there's that weak stick. The stick is there, okay, but it's not a position of strength. And we're using our body to challenge the details of the opposition, right? That was one that resulted in a scoring chance. And again, we're talking about improving the conditions of the puck. Well, here we are on the wall, on the off wing, getting the puck to the middle and attacking that weak stick. And this one ends in a pass wide open net for a teammate. So that's how we can um, improve the conditions of the puck. I got a couple more clips to look at. Um, you know, we talked about linking possessions, first possession into a sequence of possessions. So now we're going to talk about, you know, we acquire the puck in the defensive zone off of a recovery. There wasn't really a lot of protection or body position involved in that other than great ice positioning coming back through the middle of the ice, low and slow, Okay, we've acquired the puck, but now it's getting that puck into a position of strength to protect it away from the body, okay? Attacking this player's weak stick. Now we feel stick pressure here, getting the puck into a position where we've got our hip protecting on the opposite side. And now we're moving the puck, okay? But what I want to watch next is something players you know, do better than almost anybody. And this is, this is a habit is what are we doing after we've acquired the puck and protected the puck to get it back another time. So we've, we've moved it. What are we doing to get it back? And um, before I play this clip out, this is something having watched a lot more youth level hockey, um, having the opportunity to is this is, this is a habit that a lot of young players need to break. They tend to make plays and then watch and wait and see for the play to develop. We're waiting to see what's going to happen. And they find themselves not skating and, and not in a position to acquire the puck back. So, you know, it starts back here, a couple of great protections, but now look at the effort, okay, to acquire the puck a second time. And it's not necessarily puck protection, okay, but I do think there are aspects of this that we can relate into, um, how we can use some of those puck protection skills into acquiring it a second time. So here's an example. Okay. The effort 
coming from underneath the puck to join the play is great after the breakout pass. But now we're using that chuck or that back push. We're inviting contact in the back to push us forward. And now it's a two on oh. Okay. And it's a second possession in the sequence. And here's one more example where it starts in the neutral zone with a possession. Okay. We move the puck. And now as we work into a space to acquire it back, right. One of the comments was allowing uh, in the player survey, allowing ourselves to be checked or not being an option. Well, here's where we can use body positioning or pre-possession protection to our advantage when acquiring the puck back. And that's getting inside the hands, hip through the hands. And again, when I talked about other details to consider stick presentation, okay. Um, effort to put yourself in that spot, but now we've got body position. Okay. At the front of the net to acquire the puck a second time. Now this player opted to shoot, but it was still a great sequence where we're giving ourselves an opportunity more than one possession in the sequence. Um, you know, the last one in, in terms of puck protection that I'll show, um, and there are many others I, I'd love for anyone to share once this is done. Um, some of the ones that, you know, maybe they've encountered is this open hip protection. You know, we've, we've seen this 10 and two skating style a lot. Um, you know, it's used, I, I think maybe sometimes overused in terms of skating with the puck, but in, in terms of puck protection, it's great um, as a form of deception with our feet, but also a way to, you know, shield the puck and put ourselves in a position to acquire it back in a better spot. So there's one open hip pivot. Here's another one where we're taking it from the wall, using that open hip pivot, okay, to shield off from this stick and that stick, open hips, and now getting a shot from the middle of the ice have improved the conditions of the puck. Um, here's one off the rush where now we're blending some of these um, puck protection skills. So an open hip pivot, okay, maybe some deception there. And now it's hip through the hands as we drive the net. Here's one more, right? Same player actually, open hip pivot, hip through the hands. And now we've taken and drawn a penalty. We've taken the puck from outside the dots in a one-on-one -on -one where we look like we're covered to a position of strength where we're actually now drawing a, a power play for our team. Um, and then there are just some examples here where we can use them in combination. So here's a seal and surround. Okay. Open hit pivot, driving the net. Great opportunity. Okay. Here's another one where we're sealing off our opponent, surrounding the puck, now going hip through hands, improve the conditions. And now it's that effort away from the puck, stick presentation to acquire the puck back a second time. And one last combination clip, okay? Using the net as protection, sealing off, getting a hip through hands, open hips. And we've improved the conditions of the puck twice for shot opportunities for our teammates from home plate. Um, and then I guess it wouldn't be uh, a presentation, you know, without um, some application or, or drills, you know, to take home with you. So just some of my favorites, um, you know, that we can look at uh, the, the forwards here in the background. So uh, this would be a great warm up. We're working on hip through hands. Again, it doesn't have to be, you know, anything um, super attractive, but it's just getting the forwards up at center ice. And you can do this with your defense as well and having the trailing player just provide light stick pressure and forcing that player to go hip through the hands. And then just adding a little extra skill, maybe doing some stick handling skills on the way back. And you can just get a steady motion. Okay, going hip through hands. Um, just ending it with a shot on goal because everyone likes a little bit of candy at the end. But it's a great way to work on that fundamental and then um, adding an extra element of, of skills, you know, puck handling on the way back. So that would be one. And then maybe uh, another progression off of this is after you've worked on hip through hands and you can add others like a chuck or a nudge, maybe start it with a short race. Um, then you can take it to the boards. And here's where it's just two one-on-one -on -one puck battles where you're challenging your players to work on specific examples of puck protection. And I think what happens a lot of the time is when we're evaluating players, we confuse a lack 
of pre-possession protections or body positioning details as a lack of compete. And I think that's incorrect. I think there's still an ability for us to teach our players to have these fun uh, foundational habits that will allow them to win more puck battles. And of course, effort or courage is a big part of compete, but I think equally as big a part of competing is having a tremendous detail that will help us overcome some of those deficiencies. And so, you know, an area of focus on this would be, again, some of those specific puck protection elements, rather than just telling our player, we want you to compete for the puck one-on-one, -on -one. it's a one-on-one -on -one battle. Well, you know, what verbiage are you using to be more specific to work on those specific puck protection skills or, or habits? So uh, here's just one. I, I saw this from a Leafs practice about a month ago. It was, uh, I, you know, circulated on Twitter. And I'm not going to talk over it, but I want you to watch. And there's, I think, four different one-on-ones that happen at all of the different elements of body position and puck protection that you see. And then a little bit of razzle dazzle skill at the end. But, you know, one of the things is this is something that not just at the NHL level or the OHL level or, you know, the professional NWHL level for women's hockey. Um, this is something that, that transfers that at all levels and you can use to gain advantage. So um, here's just, you know, one more example, um, two different drills happening. So on the right side, uh, the players are facing um, the far end. There's a coach on the dot with pucks and it's a simple uh, race to the puck that's spotted anywhere from, you know, the goal line to the boards. And basically uh, the race is to the puck, but the challenge is to gain inside body position as early as possible. And then use one of those, you know, uh, nudges, bumps, chucks, trucks, reverse hits, whatever you want to maintain it. And uh, the way that we, you know, frame it is basically whoever gets first touch on that puck is the one who's allowed to take it to the net. Um, and then on the other side, you know, is a little bit of a different context, but it's going to be two players racing to a puck. They start um, just on the top hash mark. And then there are two players on the bottom hash who are facing the far end. Their job is to provide light resistance uh, in order to get to that puck. So you'll, you'll see in this video. Okay. The player who gets first touch on the right side, they get to shoot. So now we'll flip it to the other side. Puck gets spotted and it's a two player race with a little bit of extra resistance. And the challenge is again on, on body positioning and puck protection. So the puck gets spotted. There we see a really great nudge. Okay. They get first touch. They're allowed to take it to the net. And I think that the next challenge of this for your players is after we've acquired it, what is the, the other detail or the other habit that we're using you know, to improve the conditions of the puck. So that one, you know, the player exposed the puck and, you know, really in a game, they wouldn't have had that shot opportunity. So it's linking, you know, the next play. Um, and then just the last clip before we get to questions, again, this is a one-on-one -on -one drill of Chicago Blackhawks, but I think this is, uh, I couldn't find a better example of, you know, a veteran who understands some of these finer details of body positioning and puck protection in Duncan Keith going up against a first year pro for the Chicago Blackhawks at their training camp in a one-on-one -on -one drill. And, and you're going to see, again, I, I won't really talk over this, but you're going to see how experienced um, Keith is and some of the things he uses to his advantage to win this one-on-one -on -one battle.
and perhaps where the, the younger players may be lacking and can improve. Sorry, I do have one more. Um, and it was the open hip pivot um, into protection. And I guess this is sort of what we're aiming for as coaches is um, practice to game transfer. So here's a, an example. This actually happened. This was a practice um, doing some skill development uh, the week before we played London. And uh, so here's when we're working on that open hip pivot into you know protection driving across hands and sure enough okay during the game we see that exact drive across hands okay and then later same practice okay we're working on um hopefully it loops through here okay so one-on-one -on -one entering the zone with a delay cutting across hands and then coming across to the net okay or driving straight across hands to the back post so here is that motion now. We do a great job of protecting the puck, driving across hands, cutting uh, or attacking a weak stick. So we ended up with two goals from, from one practice. It was really neat practice to game transfer. Um, and I've, I've seen some examples of that, again, in some of these other presentations um, that have been put on by the HEO. So just thought I'd share that. And uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions, then I'm, uh, I'm happy, to, happy to answer them. Awesome. Thanks a lot for that, Wes. That was that was really good. Um, I don't have any questions in yet. I do have a question that I'll, I'll kick it off if anyone wants to jump in afterwards. Um, so we see a lot of this and you see a lot of it at the minor hockey level now where players are really good at protecting the puck and, and a lot of coaches are, are working on that. The issue when you see in games is F2 and F3 is not being able to improve the puck because F2 and F3 are kind of in no man's land. How do you guys work on finding F2 and F3 so that uh, if you're working on a battle in the corner, F2 is able to be in a position to improve that puck? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, and, and I think, you know, I, I alluded to it, but didn't really dive in on, on all of the other things to consider in acquiring the puck, body position and, and puck protection is certainly one of them. Um, but like puck support and communication, stick presentation, you know, there are so many other details that are um, required to acquire the puck. And it's a whole other presentation into itself about, you know, are we really options? I think one of the things that you know, I've observed in all players is, you know, when they didn't get the puck on a shift, they come to the bench and they're upset, you know, visibly either with their teammate or just in general that ah, I was open and I didn't get the puck. And the question is, were you open? You know, you may have thought you were, but, but were you to begin with? And, you know, you could do a whole presentation on, on acquiring the puck. One of the things that you know, we try to do is incorporate when we're doing some of these skill drills, you know, adding some of that um, either token pressure or, or extra pressure on the player without the puck and challenging them to use their detail to put themselves in a position to, to acquire it off of a pass. You know, so if it's, um, you know, an F1 four check where they're going in to retrieve a puck and then F2's job is to fight against that pressure to get inside their hands and, and stand in the soft spot and try and time it to acquire it for a shot. So I think there's ways to certainly incorporate that F2, F3 um, effort, you know, or detail to acquire the puck uh, when they're the ones who aren't directly involved in the play, for sure. Awesome. Thanks for that. Um, anyone else with questions? I haven't seen any come in. Any questions? Ask them now or forever hold your peace. JR, can I ask a, just a comment? Sure. Uh, Wes, um, I uh, was looking up some information today about you and just to see where you're from. And I uh, actually found a couple of my buddies from Renfrew that uh, played with you. And they said they always had to cover for you to protect the puck in the ozone. And I wanted to know if that was true. 
I don't know if you know who they are. Unequivocally, that is 100% true. Uh, Kip Mulvihill and, uh, and Ryan McIntyre, great people and much better hockey players than I could have ever dreamed of being. And I have no doubt that they had to do a lot of things to cover for my mistakes. That's great because they cover a lot for me too when I play tonight at, uh, at nine o'clock. So uh, they're <laughs> on my tell them that I said hi. I will do that. All right. Thanks for the great presentation. Awesome. I don't see um, any other questions, so we'll get you out of there on that one. Thanks a lot, Wes. I, I really appreciate it.